Welcome to the Classical Academy. We are honored you're here today. Uh, it, is, it is my belief that you need to do your research, that you need to dig into whatever school it is that you are going to be sending your kids to because education matters. Uh, the education of our kids in this country matters greatly. And so we appreciate you taking the time to check us out, and I encourage you to do your homework. I encourage you to ask questions, um, and if we can't answer them, if we can't rightly and justly explain to you what it is that we do and why we do it, then there's an issue. Um, and I hope that you are comfortable with what we do. I hope that you come to understand and love what we do in the same way that, that I do. Uh, I believe we have in the best educational program in Sarasota. I believe classical education is the best way to go. But I encourage you and implore you to do your research um, and dig into it. So um, let's get started. Uh, the Classical Academy is a classical uh, approach to education. And so what that is, in essence, is a back-to-basics approach. It's a return to those fundamental and foundational things that we used to do in this country up until about the 1930s, 1940s. So it's a return to those basic, fundamental, foundational things. We teach Latin at all grade levels. We believe that it's foundational to our understanding of English. It helps us learn other subjects. It helps us learn other languages. It just creates a far-reaching foundation for our education. Uh, we teach in those early grades. I notice a lot of you have younger students. In those early grades, we are an explicit phonics school. And so what that does is it teaches kids the letter sounds. Versus a whole language or a sight word based reading program, we teach kids the 26 basic alphabet letters, and then there's 45 additional multi-letter phonograms that the kids learn along with that. And so what we do is we give them the tools to decode or sound through any word. So now there's no such thing as an unfamiliar word. They have those tools and then can break those words into their parts and sound through them. And as the vocabulary becomes more complex, their reading level can continue to escalate and continue to improve because they have a strong foundation in reading. When it comes to spelling, we teach the spelling rules. Spelling counts, spelling matters as it should. So along with the phonics comes the spelling piece. Our kids are able to sound out words and they're also able to sound words because they understand the rules. The jobs of silent final E. What does a vowel do at the end of a syllable? And all the different rules that come with that. And those are foundational pieces, uh, we believe, to understanding the English language. Grammar matters. So we start diagramming sentences in first grade. Prior to that, we start learning parts of speech. So our kids know how to build a beautiful sentence. They must know how to build a beautiful sentence before they can write a great paragraph. One thing must necessarily precede another. So that composition, that writing, continues all the way through high school. We believe it's foundational. Our kids need to be great writers because great writers make great thinkers and it makes great speakers. And so it's foundational to our understanding. Uh, when it comes to the teaching of history, history for us really creates a backbone for our curriculum, but we believe that there's a great foundation um, and a great importance that needs to be placed on history. Uh, and when we teach history, we go back to the first source of the original uh, documents uh, in the history that we're studying so that we understand history from the perspective of those that lived it. We want to make sure that we're not teaching history from our perspective, but we're teaching history from those who lived it, making the decisions they made based on the knowledge that they had, based on the, the, the time frame that they were in. Um, we are not going to place judgments or, or put our perspective upon those uh, from the past. We're going to understand history from the perspective of those who lived it. So we get a true sense of history. Geography counts. Geography matters as well. The lines of the maps, the, the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, and all of those pieces that played a role. Our kids need to have a map in mind as we talk about history. We believe those are foundational things as well. That when we're talking about a particular place on the globe or uh, a country in the world, that our kids can visualize where those things are at. The proximity of things matters. The places and the geography of things matters, and we want our kids to understand those foundational and fundamental things. So what we've done is we have a four-year cycle with our history that repeats itself three times over the course of our 12 years. And I know most of you have, a lot of you have younger kids here, pre-K, but it's going to be a minute, and they're going to be in high school. So I want to paint the whole picture for you so that you can kind of see the whole scope. And then I'll come back and I'll explain our pre-K and our preschool program to you uh, in a little more depth. But we have our, our four-year cycle. So our first grade, our fifth grade, and our ninth grade all study ancient history. So the beginning of time all the way up through the fall of Rome. So we start with the creation story, come up through the ancient Phoenicians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Israelites, up through Greek and Roman times. So those kids are learning all about that first the first foundations of history. Uh, 
then our second grade, our, our uh, sixth grade, and our tenth grade study from the fall of Rome, about 476, up through uh, 1400. So the, the Middle Ages, the medieval times, the Renaissance. Um, then our third grade, our seventh grade, and our eleventh grade study from the, uh, 1400 to 1850. So the age of exploration up through the Revolutionary War. So as, as the world is being discovered, as, as different parts of the world are being explored and different parts of the world are being discovered, we learn all about that. And then we learn all about the founding of our great country and the Revolutionary period. Then finally, our fourth grade, our eighth grade, and our twelfth grade study from 1850 pre-Civil War era up through today. So the build up to the Civil War and then all the major pieces of history that have brought us into today. Uh, so that over the course of that four years, our kids hear and know the story of the world from the beginning to the end. They see how history oftentimes repeats itself, but also how it builds upon itself. Our founding fathers did not come up with this, the idea for this country on their own. They looked to the past. They looked to the Code of Hammurabi. They looked to the Ten Commandments. They looked to the Magna Carta, the philosophies of John Locke. So they took all of that great information and they built our great country based upon those foundations. As we come back to it, so we start in, the, in those lower grades. We paint the big picture, the big ideas. So we give them those, those big um, concepts in those early grades. And then as we come back to it in middle school and then again in high school, we go deeper into the context and deeper into the detail. We read at a much deeper level our history. So as they, they study uh, the founding of our country in third grade and the Revolutionary War, and they, they learn and they memorize parts of the Declaration of Independence, when they get to 11th grade, they read most of the Federalist Papers in the course of the 11th grade year so that they understand the founding of our country. But again, we go back to the first source, to the original documents, so that they understand why things were done the way that they were done in the time that they were done. Then we work very hard to tie the literature we read to the history we study. So as our kids become readers uh, in third, fourth, and above, those kids will read books that are set within or written about the time period of our history. So for instance, fourth grade. Fourth grade reads Tom Sawyer. They're studying 1850 to the modern day. So they read Tom Sawyer. They read Where the Red Fern Grows. They read The Secret Garden. Great books set within the time period of our history. So that our understanding of history helps us understand our literature. Understanding of literature helps us understand our history. There's a connected and a cohesiveness to it. In sixth grade, they read, uh, as they're studying the Middle Ages, they read King Arthur. They read A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. They read Robin Hood. Uh, great books, again, set within that time period of history. Uh, in ninth grade, when they come back to ancient history again, they read the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid in their entirety uh, over the course of that year, along with three or four other books. Um, so we read those great classical works of literature over the course of our year, but it's tied to our history so that there's a connected piece to it, um, and our kids have a greater depth of understanding within those subjects. The way our math is structured is math is the first hour of every day. So from 8.30 to 9.20, it's math across the board. What that allows us to do is level our math program. So starting in first grade, we can move kids up. We find that some kids with math, just the wheels turn quickly. Fantastic. We can take a first grader who's advanced in math and we can move them to a second grade class. We can move them to a third grade class. It really doesn't matter. What matters is their level of understanding. So we want to make sure that we're challenging them appropriately, especially with math, because some of those wheels turn very quickly for some of our kids. On the other hand, some wheels turn a little more slowly. That's okay. It's not about the grade, it's about the ability level. So we'll slow kids down. We want to make sure that they have a foundation. They memorize their math facts. They have to know their math facts. It's just a part of math. So we memorize those as a part of our math curriculum. They start learning their addition and subtraction tables in kindergarten, and they continue it all the way up. We're doing multiplication and division by second and third grade, and they memorize those tables so that they have that knowledge in mind and they can do, begin to do complicated math in their heads. Um, the way our science program is structured is we took the high school sequence of science, which is typically biology, chemistry, physics, and then an elective or an earth science type class, and we've moved it down. So our first grade is all biology, our second grade is all chemistry, our third grade is all physics, our fourth grade is all earth science. Then it repeats itself through the middle school. So fifth grade is all biology, sixth grade is all chemistry, seventh grade is all physics, fourth grade is all earth science. What we're doing is we're laying a foundation. We're going back to those basics. We lay a foundation for a full year in that science so that our kids have a depth of understanding so that when they get to the middle school and high school years, there is a deep understanding of those sciences and then they can take it beyond into college uh, and the career that they choose to um, pursue. But we want to give them a depth of knowledge. Like I said, the kids get Latin. 
Uh, they start getting Latin in kindergarten, and then it continues all the way up. We require a full year of Latin at the high school level, so they have to take one full year of Latin with us at the high school level, and then they can continue and pursue up through four years of Latin. But it, they get Latin once a week through fourth grade, then starting in fourth grade, they start to get it more frequently. Uh, and then it continues uh, in its um, rigor as, we, as the kids age. We also offer Spanish. The kids get Spanish once a week, kindergarten, up through high school. So uh, Spanish is derived from Latin, so we've seen great benefits in kids learning both languages. There's a lot of overlap in those languages, but it's also uh, more relevant to our current culture and our society. So we want to make sure kids have those foundations um, and we give them that opportunity. So then they can choose, they take Spanish up through middle school and then at that point they can choose it as an elective course and take up to four years of Spanish at the high school level. The kids get art and music once a week. The art and the music are a study of the great artists and the great composers. We go back to the masters that have perfected the craft, those who time has esteemed as the greats. So we learn to replicate the great artists we learn to listen to the differences and the nuances between the great composers. We want our kids to understand the beautiful, timeless things that are our great artists and our great composers. And it's important that they hear and know those things, that the beauty of those timeless things comes out. Uh, it's not that modern artists, modern composers don't have something to say. It's that time has yet to tell whether it's worth being retold. The same is true of our literature. It's not that modern authors don't have something to say. It's that time has yet to yet to tell whether it's worth being retold. But the great books, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Wuthering Heights, um, The Great Gatsby, 1984, these books are timeless uh, and they have a place here. They're classical works of literature, they're classical works of art and music, and they have a great place here because they are things that have stood the test of time and those are the things that matter to us. Um, within all of that, and then uh, PE, so they get PE twice a week in those early grades. Once they get to middle school, it becomes an elective. But PE is still a study of the major sports. As they come through uh, over the course of the year, they study 10 or 11 major sports. We want them to understand the academics of the sports as much as we want them to understand the play of the sport. So that there's an academic understanding. When they sit down and watch a football game, they understand why these 11 guys are trying to kill these 11 guys. What's happening on that field of play, that there's an academic piece to it. Uh, we are first and foremost an academic institution and we want our kids to understand that. So there's, there's all of those pieces incorporated into what we do throughout our day. Um, all of that then is wrapped within an envelope of virtue. So we, when it comes to those specific aspects of faith, we leave that to the family and the church that you choose to attend. But we come back to virtue in all that we do. And so we speak to the four classical virtues of temperance, which is self-control, prudence, which is wisdom, justice, which is a sense of right and wrong, and then fortitude, which is courage. And so we talk about those virtues through the training of habit. We talk about the habit of excellence. We talk about the habit of self-control. We talk about the habit of honesty. And we, we pull those things out of our history, out of our literature, out of our math. Why must we line up our numbers? Why must our numbers be lined up when we do long division? Because it's excellent. And if we're adding and subtracting correctly, but we add and subtract the wrong numbers because we wrote... We did not write neatly, and so our numbers are misaligned. Well, then we get the wrong answer. So excellence counts, and excellence, excellence matters. So we practice those habits. We talk about those habits, because if we practice something long enough, it becomes a part of who we are. It becomes a part of our character. And then our character is shaped by that virtue. So then we raise logical citizens with virtuous hearts, which is ultimately our goal as a school. We want to send kids out who are prepared to make thoughtful decisions, wise decisions and virtuous decisions in this world who do good in this world so within all of this we work very hard to to fill the mind not what to think but how to think so we work very hard to create from a blank slate so what that implies and what that means is that we don't do worksheets we don't do handouts we don't do fill in the blanks we give kids a blank piece of paper and from nothing we create something the idea behind it is that we're filling the mind with great information their mind is always with them it never shuts off. Pieces of paper can be thrown away. Computers can be turned off. Their mind is with them. They can recall that knowledge at any point in time if they need to. So they draw forth that information as they're learning. So we, we, one of our favorite tools that we use is a blank journal. And I'll show you some of these, those as we tour around the school. Um, but it's blank on top and lined on the bottom. The kids will draw the picture on the top and then fill out the information below. What we're doing is we're setting things in the long-term memory. So the teacher will, will talk about it, the teacher will draw it, the teacher will write it, then the students will talk about it, the students will write it. 
and the students will draw it. So we're setting those things in that long-term memory. Uh, we do a lot with songs and chants, especially in the early grades. So preschool all the way up through really fifth, sixth grade. Uh, after that, it gets a little more difficult and too much arm twisting in the middle school to try to get those kids to sing. Um, so, so we do our very best with that, but our goal is to, to set things uh, in the long-term memory again. And so if we take a complicated idea and we set it to a simple tune, our kids will remember it. Our kids will hold on to it for the long term. And that's our goal, is we want them, their minds to be filled with beautiful things. We want their minds to be full of great information so that they're a part of what we would call the great conversation. So that as they grow, as they age, and they hear things, they hear about a great adventure, they think back to Odysseus. And they think back to the Odyssey because they have this great information in mind. And now they're not on the outside of a conversation. They're on the inside of a conversation. They have information uh, that matters. When they, when they hear about federal and state rights, they understand what those things mean. And they have a deeper understanding. And those things matter. Those things count um, at all times and especially now. And so it's important that our kids understand those things and have a logical argument and, 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 and facts that, that, that reinforce what they believe. We, we say all the time, and I, I, I make it clear to the kids, I love them. I love them dearly. I know every student's name uh, on this campus. It is, I, I make it my job and my uh, mission by the end of the first week to know every student's name when they come on this campus, and it will be forever that. Is no matter how big we get, that will be my goal. And I love them dearly. I don't care how they feel. Feelings are fickle. And so we don't want them to rely on their feelings because our feelings will change. Our feelings will ebb and flow based upon the day. But our minds and logic is how we make decisions. We make decisions based on logic. We make decisions based on reason. And if we make decisions based on reason and thought, then we'll make better decisions. We'll make wiser decisions and we'll ultimately be better off. Um, and so within all of those things, we work very hard to make sure that we're training a logical mind and a virtuous heart. And we come back to those things all the time. I constantly am, am going back to those ideas with our staff in staff trainings and in all that we do. It's about training a logical mind and a virtuous heart. And we have to shepherd those very carefully. And we take that job very seriously. In terms of some of the extracurriculars, because we know that our kids want to be involved in those things. We have uh, 23 different middle and high school sports that we offer. So starting in fifth grade, our kids can compete in everything from flag football, volleyball, golf, uh, soccer, cross country and track, and a multitude of other sports. Uh, we also have a fantastic theater program. We do a, a major production every fall and every spring. So far, we've done nine major productions. Our theater department is hands down one of the best uh, groups of, of actors and, and cast that, that I have seen, and I've seen some great productions at the Van Wazel and different places, and our kids and our theater teacher do an excellent job. Uh, they just put on The Wizard of Oz uh, this past October. It was spectacular. Uh, Dorothy knocked it out of the park. She was uh, one of our seventh graders, just nailed it all, and it was from the, the staging to the costumes to the lighting, all of it was excellent. We go back to excellence in all that we do. If we are going to do something, it needs to be excellent. If it's not, we are not going to do it. Um, we just come back to that in all that we do, but we want to give kids those opportunities to pursue extracurricular things. Uh, we are really building our music program. We intend to have a full orchestra program within the next couple of years, uh, and we're very excited about that. We have a very active National Honor Society. Our kids are graduating. Uh, we've had 20 total graduates so far since we, we began the school seven years ago. Uh, we had 10 in our first six years. We opened as a K-10, um, and we had 10 graduates in our first few years. Last year, we had 10 additional graduates, so we had a graduating class of 10, uh, and we've been growing from the bottom up. Uh, and our kids, this last year, uh, we had a, kids accepted to 50 or 60 different colleges around the nation. Um, so they can and have the ability to get into whatever college they choose uh, and work hard enough to get into. Um, we have a young man who's up at the University of Florida right now. Uh, we have kids that have gotten into the USF. We have kids that are at UCF. Uh, we have a young lady that's up at Hillsdale College right now. So our kids are able to get into top performing colleges from around the country. Um, questions at this time? that I can answer. Let me speak to kindergarten and pre-K for just a minute. Um, so the way our kindergarten and pre-K work is we take the first grade curriculum and we kind of scale it back. 
So our kindergarten, I'll speak to that and then just kind of work my way down. The way our kindergarten is structured is we spend the first third of the year in ancient history. We do that because uh, we want to make sure we paint those, those old stories, the foundational things. And then we spend the last two thirds of the year in American history. And we do that because our kids aren't going to get American history with us again until third and fourth grade. So we want to make sure we're laying a foundation. So we start with 1000 AD and the, up, the discovery of Upper North America by Leif Erikson. And then we come up through usually the early 1900s. But they, we, we, uh, we, we touch on all the big ideas and the big uh, time periods within that history. Um, they touch on all the sciences. So we go through all the different sciences in kindergarten. We... Um, uh, in terms of our math, we're actually using our first grade curriculum in kindergarten. So Saxon math is the program that we use, and we actually use first grade Saxon in kindergarten. We find that it gives kids a little more of a, a challenge, an appropriate challenge, and we found great success with that. So that continues all the way up. So our, our third grade is using the fourth grade curriculum um, as far as our math is concerned. The way pre-K works then and preschool is we scale that back. So uh, they, they learn all about American history. Uh, and it's built kind of around the letters of the week, but they learn, they learn the major events within American history. They also learn about the major landmarks around America and the world. Uh, the sciences, we touch on all the sciences in our preschool and pre-K. We believe that it's important that kids get history, math, science, uh, reading every single day and every single uh, grade level. Those are just foundational things. One subject is no more important than another. Uh, so we want our kids to get those foundational pieces uh, at all levels. Um, the way our, our day is structured within preschool and pre-K, uh, we have part-time and half-time options. So our pre-K, you can choose either part-time, which is either three full days a week or five half days a week, or you can come full-time, which is five full days a week. The way the day itself is structured then within preschool and pre-K is the, is the morning is academic. So from 8.20 to noon, that's the academic portion of the day. Uh, the kids then eat lunch in the classrooms. And then uh, they go outside for a little bit, and there's recess in the morning as well. There's lots of breaks throughout the day for all of our kids because we keep them very busy in the classrooms, and they need those breaks because they're kids, and we want to make sure that they have that downtime. Um, but they go outside for a little bit in our preschool and pre-K, and then they come back inside for quiet time and nap time because they're little, and 95% of our kids end up falling asleep, even those whose parents keep telling us, oh, my kid doesn't nap anymore. Miraculously, when they show up here, they're tired and they sleep. Um, so uh, that's, that's the way our day is structured within our preschool and our pre-K programs.